the heck am I gonna hold that? Like that. Good morning, everybody. And welcome back to another episode of God Knows What with Sergey Butenko. I still haven't chosen a name for the show. That's the skinny right there. In the first episode of One Weed, One Recipe or Wild Edibles Test Kitchen, there was a call to action. I asked you for help deciding on a name. I took all your show names, slapped them in a Word doc, and now I'm sitting here reading, laughing out loud and having a good time. Forge to fork, forking foraged foods, one weed at a time, weed gastrology, weed me, nutritious weeds, weeds for dinner, uh, deliciously wild, one by one, a forager's plate. Here's one that's pretty clever, a forageable meal with Sergey. I think that's kind of like a play on words for affordable, but instead it's affordable. Here's a personal favorite, the Weeders Digest. <laughs> you are watching another episode of the Weeders Digest. Wild edible eats, weeds like to eat. Eat the wild one, Oregon foraging show. That's not gonna work even though I like the name. I may some days not be foraging in Oregon. Going wild with your food, new to foraging, very clever, K-N-E-W. Here's another personal favorite, snip snap, forge that just kind of rolls off your tongue. Snip snap, forge that. And so this is what I'm doing. I'm just going through all of your names one by one, and I will be updating this list regularly until we decide a show name. So thanks again for weighing in. Long story short, I haven't chosen a name yet. And if I'm being honest, I'm leaning right now towards my own name, which is Wild Edibles Test Kitchen, primarily because it has the word wild edibles in it, which is a good search engine optimization word. I also feel it tells people exactly what the show's about. I'm not like thrilled at the name, but what are you gonna do? You gotta mix creativity and practicality these days. So, if I choose my own name and nobody wins a book, please do not despair. There will be lots more opportunities to win free stuff because I love, love, love giving things away. In today's episode, we are gonna be making a wild sweet pea wrap or burrito. What is the difference between a wrap and a burrito anyway? Yeah. Is a burrito more like breakfast food and a wrap is more lunch? But you can eat a burrito for dinner. Anyway, we're gonna be harvesting wild sweet pea Mary stems, we'll get to what that is in a little bit, and turning them into a delicious wrap. So if you like the sound of that, stick around, because it's gonna be fun and delicious. Mari, say hi, say good morning. Since we often have to walk a little ways to get to our destination, to get to our wild edibles, it only makes sense to talk a little bit of theory and lay down some more knowledge on to my viewers. And in today's video, let me just lighten that up a little bit. There we go, that looks better. In today's video, one of the benefits that I wanna talk about is the fact that wild edibles get you out of nature. They get you outdoors. This is becoming increasingly more important as we all spend more time online. I'm as guilty as the next, if not more, because I work on YouTube. And so I need to walk my own talk. I need to be in nature more. I need to breathe fresh air. You know, because when you go outside, you automatically get a few different benefits. Number one, I'm breathing fresh air. First thing in the morning, I'm breathing fresh air and it's doing my body good. When I'm out here, I have to physically move. I have to get to the place where the weed is growing, or the wild edible rather, and I have to crouch and dig and move. That's a benefit that we call exercise. Eventually, when the sun rises, it's gonna be shining down upon me. We call that vitamin D. And that's another benefit of being outside. Just by going outside to look for weeds, we're benefiting before we even put them in our mouth. I suppose I should do my into the wild spiel. Seems only fitting. Because Chris McCandless, the dude from the Into the Wild story, supposedly, according to John Krakauer, the author of Into the Wild, met his bitter end by eating a wild sweet pea variety. And so it's not gonna look good if in a foraging video, I don't touch on whether or not wild sweet pea is dangerous. You know, I've been teaching foraging classes 
been doing wild edibles events for a very long time. And at every single event without fail, somebody always brings up the story of Into the Wild. A quick synopsis is that this character, Chris McCandless, basically decides he wants to live off the land and be sustainable and starts learning about plants, moves to Alaska, starts eating a plant, then he realizes that he misidentifies the plant, and then he dies. That is the account written by John Krakauer in the book Into the Wild, later then turned into a movie. Most of that story is false and inaccurate because as it turns out, Chris McCandless actually starved to death. He was very, very malnourished. He had been living out in the outdoors for a long time, not eating enough food, and eventually it caught up with him and he starved to death. That was the official coroner's report. He didn't die from a plant, he starved to death. Unfortunately, in order to make a better story, Krakauer made up some BS about how it was caused, his death was caused by a wild plant, and that wild plant was either wild potato or wild sweet pea. It's kind of unclear and there's numerous renditions about what actually happened and yada, yada, yada. Basically, all you need to know is that fellow forager Samuel Thayer, who's like one of the foraging gurus out there, every book he writes is absolute gold. He wrote a book called Nature's Garden, and on page 43, there's a really good, honest account of what happened behind the scenes and into the wild, how the dude starved to death, as I already mentioned, how all the plants that were supposed culprits were studied extensively in the wake of his death, and none of them were found to have any alkaloids, any toxins, any poisonous parts. One of the scientists that studied both plants later was quoted saying that he would eat both wild sweet pea and wild sweet potato. So this is a long-winded way of saying that wild sweet pea is not dangerous, it's not poisonous, it does not have any poisonous parts, and I've eaten it hundreds of times myself with no ill effect. And so, now you know. This is probably also a great time to say that I don't treat this stuff lightly, you guys. I am a stickler for safety. My biggest concern is that people follow my advice and harm their bodies. I don't want that to happen. And so, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt and test everything on yourself. Just because Sergey says that wild sweet pea is not poisonous, don't just take my word as gospel. Try little parts of it on yourself first. Make sure it doesn't negatively impact you. And once you've cleared the plant and know how your body reacts, then have at it. That's just common sense, you guys. It's the most cautious, most sensible way to proceed when it comes to foraging. Let's go right. Come on, let's go right. We've almost arrived to my secret wild sweet pea spot. Deep, deep in the woods. Usually wild sweet pea kind of likes the sun, but for some reason in this spot, it's growing really well in the shade. We're heading right into that little crook right there. And I've been looking at the spot for weeks, just waiting for it to get good. And now that it's good, I'm bringing you with me. Here is the plant that we're after. This plant right here. So right here in front of me, there's just a jungle of green, and maybe it's a little bit difficult to discern what's what, but we're gonna get through that by implementing our technique of describing plants to ourselves so that we remember them for life. This vine-like plant growing in this bush of other plants is wild sweet pea, the plant that we're after. And the very first identifying characteristic is the fact that it is a vine. Wild sweet pea is a pea relative, same as cultivated peas in our garden. 
And if you've ever grown peas, you know that they're vines. And so a very, very good way to recognize this pea plant is by seeing that it grows like a vine. And the vine, it literally takes over other plants. It sprawls and grabs things and uses them as trellises for support. So that's identifying characteristic number one. Another good identifying characteristic is that the main stem of this plant is kind of wide. It has like a stem part here in the middle and then it has flaps on both sides, if that makes sense. You know, if you just study this stem, you'll see that it looks very unique. It's not like a slender, here's some bracken right here, for example, and the bracken has a very slender round stem, whereas the pea plant has a flat stem. And the flat stem also has like this white dust on it. And if you rub it off, it comes off and turns a brighter green color. We also have these bigger leaves and they kind of look like garden pea plants. These leaves are pretty fibrous. I don't really recommend eating them just because they're not as delicious, but they are, they are edible. In fact, all parts of this plant are edible. The pea shoots, the leaves, the actual bean pods, if you find any, as well as the flowers. Now we're not seeing any flowers on this plant anywhere. Yep, no flowers. And so I'm gonna try very hard to cut away and find some flowers for you just so that you can see them. They range in color from pink to purple to violet. And they're very, very crunchy and delicious in salads and beyond, so they're very good eaten. And then my favorite identifying characteristic is also the part that we're gonna be going after. And these are the tender tips of the wild sweet pea. These tips kind of look like bean sprouts almost, like pea sprouts, probably because they are pea sprouts. And they have a very unique look to them, as well as this little tendril right here. And so the tendril is the part of the plant, the vine, that reaches out and grabs stuff. If you look at the very ends of the tendril, if the camera can pick them up, that is, you'll be able to see that they almost have like Velcro-like hooks on them. Can you see that? They have tiny little hooks on the edges. And so this is what helps the plant climb. These little tips are a good lesson in Mary stems. All proficient foragers have to learn how to identify the growing parts of plants, i.e. Mary stems. These parts are generally more nutritious because they have all kinds of micronutrients and carbohydrates in them to help the plant grow and divide to help the cells divide. In fact, in Greek, the term meristem, the root of the word means to divide, to grow. And so the growing parts of plants, i.e. meristems, are the most delicious, nutritious parts. And if you want to eat really good and really healthy, ah, then you have to learn how to find these parts. How do you find meristematic parts? Well, generally the easiest way I found is they're gonna be very tender to the touch. And so just like asparagus, you know, where the tops break off when they're tender, you're gonna come over to the wild sweet pea and just feel around and the parts that snap off easily in your fingers, those are the meristematic bits that you wanna go after. And so these are the parts that we'll be collecting today for our burrito wrap that we're making. So we find some tender bits. These things are some of the best eaten out there. They're very sweet to the taste. They taste like very premium expensive sprouts, the kind you might get from a health food store, spend lots of money on, except they're totally free because they're wild food. And, um, if I had to equate them to like a familiar food, I would say that they taste almost like sugar snap peas. Mari loves eating these wild sweet peas too. Check it out. Here. You like that? This dog is a vegetable eating machine. Let's do another one. Just so my viewers know, 
I've done this very cautiously with my dog too. I've, I don't just feed her stuff to see how she reacts. I approach it very cautiously, same as I do for myself. And just give her a little bit at a time to make sure that it suits her body. Today I'm harvesting in a little Ziploc bag. Sometimes you don't need a big old jug. All you need is a little tiny bag. And so I'm just gonna pick these tips with my fingers. I don't even need scissors because feeling what is soft and what is not, what is tender and what is not, happens to be to my benefit with this plant. So my fingers are helping me find all of the tender meristematic bits. And I'm just leaving the rest of it intact, just letting the plant grow. And in fact, by harvesting some of these younger bits, I am helping the plant create more offspring. I'm gonna set the bag right here so I can harvest with both hands. As I already mentioned, all parts are edible. The leaves, the stem, the flowers, the pea pods. However, these tendril bits, the top tips that we've been talking about, they're the by far and large the most delicious parts. So I find I almost never go after the pea pods or the other leaves because these things just taste so much better. If you're lucky, you also find some of these things. They're like another part of the pea. They almost look like seed pods, though I don't think these are the actual seed pods because the seed pods grow as little peas. And these parts are really edible and delicious too. Maybe that's where the flower comes out. So your job, just to beat a dead horse to death, is to go through and find the most tender parts of this plant. And those are the parts you're gonna be collecting for the burrito. Any part that snaps off in your hands is fair game. Even the tendrils, like these little tendrils that look like a mess of twine. And it tastes pretty good. And in the bag they go. One dead giveaway that something is likely meristematic is when it's a little bit lighter green in color. Hopefully you can see that with this particular one that I'm twirling right now. It's a lighter green than say this mature leaf right here. Can you see that? That is one dark green leaf and it's very firm and full of cellulose. So this is not an ideal meal. You can still eat it, it's edible, but it's not gonna be the most de delicious part of the plant. Whereas this tender light green tip is gonna be like a baby green consistency. It's gonna be very crunchy, very crisp, and extremely nutritious. That's pretty good right there. Again, we don't ever wanna to be too greedy. We wanna take enough for ourselves for our loved ones and then leave the rest intact for other animals and people. We finally made it into the kitchen again and the very first step is to wash our wild edibles. Wild sweet pea is going to get washed. This gives us another opportunity to pick through it and make sure that there is no foreign and unintentional plants in here. But before we get there, I just wanted to quickly show my viewers the difference between wild sweet pea and pea sprouts. Yesterday when I went shopping in preparation for this episode, I went ahead and purchased some organic pea shoots. And I believe this package was somewhere in the ballpark of like $10, $12, something like that. I paid 12 bucks for that. I paid zero bucks for that. Let's just quickly open both up and I'll show you the difference. These are store-bought pea shoots, and these are wild foraged sweet peas. You know, they're similar but different. There's definitely some K2 
characteristics that convey the fact that both of these are peas, to me anyway, but you can also see that they're quite different in that these ones have flat leaves, flat stems, they have very pronounced tendrils, and they have very pointy leaves. Whereas these have much smaller tendrils, hopefully the camera can even pick that up, you know, much smaller than this tangled mess right here. And then the leaves are very round and clover-like, oval-shaped leaves. And the entire plant of the pea shoot sprout is a meristem. It's very easy, very tender, very easy to break. So I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of perspective. Sometimes when I say these things look and taste like sprouts, maybe that's not enough to really help you get the picture. But these are really like these sprouts right here. And we are just gonna dump our entire sweet pea harvest in some water. I like to reuse these little bags as much as possible, so I'm gonna set that aside for later use. And now we just give them a thorough rinse. So here again, we just are gonna wash our greens and pick through them to make sure that we have no stragglers. This is much easier to do than with miner's lettuce because we pick them a little bit more carefully. That said, we still want to take the time and do this right so that we don't harm ourselves in any way by eating something we're not supposed to. So here's our mountain of wild collected sweet peas. And you can see that you can fit quite a bit in one of these little Ziploc bags. They compress pretty well and it may not look like it initially, but you know, a full bag of this stuff makes a really decent sized pile of greens. Wah! It's important to hold these things apparently. So as we already established, these wild pea shoots are very delicious. They're so delicious, in fact, that they don't need a whole lot of seasoning. And so I'm gonna work with that today. I'm gonna lightly season these with a little olive oil right here, a little sea salt, maybe a little black pepper, and maybe even a little lemon. And then we're gonna roll all of this together with some other good stuff in a tortilla, thus creating a nice, hearty, delicious wrap for, us, for myself for lunch, for yourselves if you try it. You can leave these whole by all means, but I like to just give them a nice little chop first. I think it's just more pleasant in the long run. So I'm gonna chop these in like one inch sections, one to two inch sections. And then I'm gonna throw them in the bowl. Squeeze the juice of half a lemon onto these peas. It's looking pretty good. We're gonna do two to three tablespoons of olive oil. I'm just doing it by sight because again, I don't really follow recipes. We are gonna crush some pepper on top to taste. And also hit these peas with a pinch of sea salt. So just about like that. Not too much, less is more here. That's looking really, really good. There you go, camera two. Can you see that? I always, always try my food many, many times. This ensures that all the flavors are balanced properly. In episode one, we talked about the five basic flavors. I'm not gonna hammer you about that here too much, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch episode one, Miner's Lettuce Side Salad. So that taste test right there told me that it needed more salt. So I quickly added some more salt to adjust the flavor. And now I'm gonna taste it again. Mm, perfect. Again, with this specific recipe, less is more. So keep it kind of simple. These are no particular tortillas. I just grabbed some off the shelf. This looks like a local brand called La Barita. Feel free to use your favorite tortillas. And this plate right here, the ceramics plate, 
is a beautiful plate that my sister Valia made. So she's a ceramicist among other things and she made these beautiful plates which I get to eat off. I like heaping amounts of greens and I'm going to do that in this recipe as well. Just a lot of greens, a lot of these pea greens already seasoned. This could probably make two giant burritos. We'll leave that. We'll leave this for later. Maybe I'll make one for my wife. And once you got the heaping peas on your tortilla, it's nice to come in here and work with what you got. Today I have one ripe avocado. I got a little bit of brie cheese. Again, all of the non-vegan options are optional. If you like, you can just eat the burrito as is. But I find that if you add a little bit of cheese to it, it makes it a little heartier and holds you over a little bit better. So I just take some brie cheese and put it like so. Three pieces is good, but five pieces is better. I'm hungry today, so let's make it one whole avocado. One whole small avocado. You can see that the more we add onto it, the more color and the more texture we add, the better we're building this thing, the more appetizing it looks. So, you know, there's another tip for you. Just make your food colorful. The little things have a big impact. So, you know, just, let's keep going with that. Here we have a watermelon radish. We we're actually growing these in the garden this year. So I'm going to see if I can have, if my thumb is green enough to actually grow something that looks this beautiful. This particular radish I got at our local market of choice. And so you can buy these in the store and it's just a different type of radish. So we shall slice that up nice and thin. I want more uniformed radish bites in my burrito. So I'm going to just slice them in long strips, throw that in there like so and garnish with a little dill. This is called greens on greens on greens. This is how I eat. So I got to be authentic. A little green onion. Again, all of this is super flexible. Whatever herbs and spices you have on hand is just fine. And we might as well do a little carrot because because we can. This grater right here looks super busted up and broken. I've had this grater in my family for about almost 30 years and it's the best grater I've come across. And I know there's prettier graters out there, but for some reason I just can't let this one go. So it's a little insider information. And then we garnish with some carrots. That looks beautiful and I'm super salivating. If I wasn't before, now I am. Okay, so the very last touch, because I like spicy food, I'm gonna put my favorite hot sauce on it. This is a local hot sauce called Joey's, made by a guy here at the farm, farmer's market. So shout out to you, Joey. And this one is called Lisa the Truffle Queen. So this has truffle mushrooms in it. I'm just gonna put a nice hearty dousing of hot sauce on this delicious wrap. And I'm going to call that good. This is my lunch right here. This is what I'm going to eat here in about 15 minutes. It was such an easy recipe that there was almost no recipe to it. You just season it with a few basic things and I promise you it's going to be delicious. Everything that's on this plate right now is full of vitamins, nutrients, minerals, antioxidants, micronutrients, etc., etc. So it's going to do my body good. Not only that, but this meal is hearty. It's going to give me enough energy to run around and do all the other things I need to do today. And so this is a great combination of satiating, but won't make you feel super heavy and won't bog you down. This is how Sergey eats wraps for lunch. These are the types of wraps that I make my wife. And now you know that these are the types of wraps that you can make for yourself. I just showed you how to do it. Thank you guys again for watching. This is episode two of the unnamed wild edibles cooking show. If you want to help me out, please like this video. That really, really helps me when you do that. And if you like what you see and want to subscribe, well, that's even better. That's it. That's all more wild edibles, episodes, cooking episodes coming down the pipeline soon. 
Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.